Thank you very much. Is any better now? Th well, thanks. In any case, thanks very much for coming. Maybe Naltan can uh, can look after the sound. And uh, the title of your lecture, I have it here. You probably have it on your slides as well. Human skills for robots, transferring human knowledge and capabilities uh, to robotic task execution in surgery. So maybe I have to stop sharing now. Thank you very much and good morning everyone all around the globe. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thanks a lot for organizing. I think it has been a wonderful semester and uh, we have seen some new and old folks from all around the world. So uh, what I would like to talk to you today is like how this all kind of robotics and learning and cognitive science paradigm is emerging into the field of surgery, which is something new, which is something we have never been exploring in this depth. But I think um, I fell in love with it uh, from the first time when I heard probably eight years ago that surgery is just transforming the way we do. Uh, a brief couple of sentences about our institution before we move on. So we are one of the largest uh, universities in Budapest or in Hungary. Uh, we are located next to the Danube. Uh, we are right now sitting in one of those nice buildings. Actually, this particular building is not that nice, but uh, the rest of the campus is pretty much okay. And um, we have eight faculties, and we belong to the uh, Faculty of Electrical Engineering and IT. Uh, next, please. So my personal background, I'm an electrical engineer and a biomedical engineer. And uh, most of my work is related to surgical applications, medical technologies. And as uh, Ralph said, I also have a spin-off company that's trying to forward hand hygiene and hand hygiene control, introducing it, hopefully a new device, uh, later next year. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> so what we are, we are going to address here is a certain type of robots, robots that we use in the operating room. Um, so if you, if you look around, and if, particularly if you want to do for, uh, as a structured way, we have industrial robots that we are all familiar with, and we have a totally new paradigm service robots. And of course, all these medical applications, all that are, raises, are raising many, many interesting questions are the, the service robots, because within, next please, uh, we have tons of different ways of using them. So first and foremost, we have a large group of home care or just elderly care robots, which we are very interested in. If you look into EU projects and new proposals, the next five years are going to be all about these uh, care robots. But also in the medical area, we have non-surgical robots as well, patient carrying or just rehabilitation robots. But my focus has always been on surgical stuff. I think this is the most exciting when you, uh, when you do surgery. But if you look into the classical way, the, the traditional approach is to keep the patient or the human, any human, out of the robot's workspace. Even the, current, the currently valid ISO standard says that, that robots and humans must be separated. So how are we going to do surgery when the robot cannot touch the patient? And in the old days, please go forward, uh, they, they just said like, we don't care, we just, we just want to use a robot because we like robots because robots are so good. For, for what are they so good? They are precise, they are accurate, they can do what we want, we, we can, they can do what we tell them to do. And of course, these could be used to improve surgery. So the, in the old days, almost 30 years ago, they just pushed in an industrial robot to the operating room, registered it to the CT scan, put a needle in it, and said, like, this is a surgical robot, do biopsy, brain biopsy. But of course, very soon, they started to realize more fine-tuned prototypes that were more adjusted to the operating room, uh, yet all these systems were just a replica of an industrial-type robot focusing on executing one single task very, in a very accurate way. Next, please. But then they realized this approach that now you can see I, I addressed it with registration or image piece when you have an understanding of the patient, you tell the robot what to do and then the robot executes, has no cognitive functions, no intelligence. It won't save the world because it's just a machining tool. Uh, so then they realized that we have to introduce some intelligence. What is the easiest way to put intelligence into a system? Incorporate the human as well. So that's what we have seen as the next generation of surgical robots, who became, by the way, very, very uh, popular, that we keep, the robot, uh, we keep the human in the loop. That's, why we can, that's how we can avoid any kind of, um, let's say, adjustment, any kind of human learning, any kind of artificial intelligence. 
we have the surgeon sitting in front of a console teleoperating robot all the time. So despite the fact this sounds really good and when we think about robotic surgery we would believe it's something wonderful, yet at the current stage it's still something very primitive and far away from what we want to achieve in the long run. And of course there is a mixture to the cooperative control. Uh, so let's, let's move it on a little because what I really want to talk about is how we're going to move on from this stage. Next please. Because what we have seen, these are some more or less successful systems being sold or, or currently available on the market. And if you see the numbers that are after the names of the systems, it's very clear that um, usually these robots sell to, to some of the, the early adopters, some pioneers buy them, but then they drop it and the technology could not really take on except for one single system. Uh, this is the Da Vinci, the button most that probably you are all, all familiar with or not, if not, I will introduce. But it's the only robot that's commercially viable. It's just generating a lot of profit to the company. But as I mentioned, that's exactly following this pattern. Keep the human in the loop, no cognition, no automation. Next, please. Because all the time, the surgeon is sitting in front of the console, putting its head into a very nice 3D visual display, and then directing the, the moves of the surgical instruments inside the human body as he or she wants it, and then the robot always follows the surgeon. Not doing more, not doing less. This way there is no liability issue, there is no problem with, uh, with errors, because the human would corrugate for anything, and uh, we don't have to worry about that. Next, please. How are we going to move on? We want to introduce all those beautiful capabilities that on the research side we have been able to do and present in the past 20 years. So the very first gradual step forward is the so-called cooperative control, when the robot has some kind of shared control over the, the surgical side. Uh, the easiest way to, to imagine it is you, you're holding the end of the tool of the robot or the device that also joins a robot. And as long as you, the surgeon is willing to do the proper thing, the robot will, will comply and will follow. But as soon as the surgeon wants to do something bad, the robot can stop the motion or can reduce it. So this way we can increase safety and gradually introduce robotic functions. But this is still just the very first step. So if we move forward, then we see that um, currently there are undergoing certain uh, things in, around the EU and around the world to support surgery on a deeper level, uh, and that is decision making. So, so far everything we addressed and the way uh, all this began historically was just introduce precision. So that was the first. Use the mechatronic structure in the operating room so you have a more precision for execution. But how do we know what to do better or how to perform better? And that's going to be the next stage. And let's move on. And that, that's what I've tried to get together because what we have now is the huge amount of information available. No one, never during the history of surgery, we have had so much information available about the patient. We can do screenings, we can do scans, we can understand the human body, we can merge it with anatomical atlases. Why don't we use all that knowledge? It's actually, we are trying to use it. So we, we show images uh, to the surgeon, we, we try to train them, but we just try to understand now how to do it. And now here's a, a path forward, how we, go, how we try to achieve it from the uh, scientific point of view. So first and foremost, we have to understand surgery. Because there's a huge, huge lack of understanding what we call surgery and what is a good surgery. So if you ask the question yourself, who is a good surgeon? How are you going to measure that? What are the key performance indicators? How many people survive under him or her? Is that good? If, if, if you die, even if you have 1% chance of dying, like removing your tonsil, probably that's not a good, good outcome. Then we, we can introduce some further metrics like time of surgery, but if it's more complex, or the survival, we, we, we're still struggling to understand how to measure surgery. And one, one project that I'm doing here with my students is just recording surgery, because that's just the fundamental, so we don't even have recordings enough of surgery. So what can you do there? Sensorize the, the, the surgeon. So put a lot of, lot of tracking, we, we have cameras, we have Kinect, we have uh, the electromagnetic tracking, we have all kinds of means that were not available 10 years ago. Put on the surgeon, and finally you can follow what they do in the operating room, 
and try to tag it, try to understand it. That's at least. And once you have that, you can, you can analyze and you can go deeper. Like not just looking into these basic functions like time of flight or, or path in the air, but you can try to use some machine learning on the collected data. And this is where robotic surgery and classical surgery are, are just fusing together because this teleoperation control paradigm that Da Vinci is using very effectively is just providing tons of data to us. So once you start recording, and this is happening, for example, uh, together with Intuitive Surgical, the manufacturer of this robot, and uh, Johns Hopkins University, they developed a recording device. It's just like a set-top box. You put it next to your robot, and when you do the practice session, it records, I think, uh, 27 parameters parallel. All joints of the robots, all control information, what's the video feed look like, and all this can come together and now we have these long, long, long recordings at large so you can do statistical analysis. Finally, this is a data set which is, which is applicable to, to get, get machine learning algorithms running on. And the, we just started it. And then the next step is to repeat surgery. So once we identify, like, okay, this is, this is how we do it, let's try to transfer this into robotic technology. And uh, this is just really the first step toward automated surgery. So one, a couple of things that already work. Um, if you identify points on a patient, then we have robotic setups, only in research uh, facilities, but we do have those, that going to put a tie around it and do it perfectly well. Force controlled, vision controlled, mixed, everything. It's going to put a perfect tie around it. However, this will only be repeat of a previously learned type from probably thousands of samples, but still lacking the human decision-making capability where to put it, how to deviate from, from the, the, the kind of optimal knot. So this, this perfect knot problem uh, just representing the complexity of the whole domain, and that's why it has like how much cognitive understanding you need. Because even putting a knot there, if you want to do it valid from the surgical point of view, you have to think about the thickness of the tissue around, the, 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 the condition of the wound, the condition of the patient, how well it will heal if you put it tighter or not, if you put it too tight, it might break, all these things. So we have to extend the scope and rather just repeating certain motions, we have to do more, and this is just the way towards automated surgery, how we look at. From these small segments we, we, we have identified and various groups are working on it around the world, we try to puzzle together full surgeries identifying how to do the best way. And uh, there have only been one reported case from uh, 2006 when they had a robotic setup, uh, a catheter-based cardiac ablation that was remotely operated, or no, it was operated by a computer and remotely mentored or oversight by another location. So this is the only case where we can see that it was fully robotically performed, so-called automated surgery because the computer made the decision where to perform the surgery itself. Yet again, this is very first step, because the relatively simple case, it worked based on a database of hundreds of surger other surgeries, very similar. Humans already analyzed, segmented, put the notation, this is what you should do in this case. Yet, the computer and the data, based on the database and some learning algorithms was able to transfer that knowledge into a new case and identify what to do correctly. Of course, you have a, a chance of validation. And for smaller functions uh, such, such as anesthesia, it's, it's getting to work. And we can link, of course, robots are very good or, or automated systems to learn from signals. So once you identify what is a good signal, like live signals, ECG and all the others, if you feed that to the robotic system, it can help in the operating room to maintain the good condition of the patient. Next, please. So. Um, of course, this is just not uh, standing in the middle of nowhere. We, we are trying to, at the same time not just advance it from the scientific point of view, but also accompany it from the legislational point of view. Because it's very important to keep in mind that we are experimenting with humans. So you should always keep that in mind. If you deploy a new technology, one day it might transition into real life, and then it will be a life or death case for certain people. So, so all the international standardization bodies are looking at it, and particularly this is missing entirely, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
robots and humans are not handled yet. Now there is a focus group at uh, ISO, the International Standardization Organization, explicitly focusing on how to solve this issue, how to regulate, standardize human-machine interfacing. And that would include medical robots and surgical robots as well to be able to identify. But we have just, just began to put down a so-called standardized concept to learn or how to say, notate, connotate aut uh, automation or autonomy. Because it's a very complex problem. So this is the best work so far that has been done. It's uh, endorsed by the uh, NIST, uh, National In Institute of Science and Technology in the United States. And you, it already gives you that, that um, figure, gives you an understanding how complex it can be. So the autonomy of the system is going to depend on the, the, the mission, the task itself, the environment, and the human interfacing it. And you have to scale all that in, to get one standard. So it's, it's a big work. It started uh, two years ago, and we don't very, really see the end of it, but it, it's undergoing. So if you're interested, next please, uh, you can join us, because this is um, an open group. So if you, if you contact your local um, National Standardization Institute, probably you can become a national expert and represent your ideas and, and your group towards building something big. And this is not only happening on the ISO or IC level, but also on, on, from the professional side. So the IEEE, uh, the Institute for Electronic and Electrical Engineers, the largest engi electrical engineering association in the world, is also having its own standards and also having its own working group to develop these standards. So this is a very, very actively evolving area, and we have a lot of people working on it. Next, please. So what we want to do and what, why, why it would make sense, because for, at first for many people it, it doesn't make much sense to work on standards, especially once, well, once you have such, such a low understanding what is going on, but we really want to support new systems. So as I, I showed you at the beginning, there are already a dozen of surgical robots available in the market. They do not have decision-making capabilities. But it's only a question of time when we introduce, because it's a software update. We already have the hardware deployed, the number of thousands in the case of the Da Vinci. You can just download a new software, and all of a sudden, your robot is capable of doing autonomous surgery, if we allow it. So it's, at this point, I believe it's very important to understand that we really have a safe, we need to have a safe framework in which we can use these systems and use all that knowledge that you have been learning about through this semester, how can we really put into a structured way what we know about our mission and use that towards system development. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, I'm open for questions. And before that, just last uh, postscript, next please, that uh, if you're interested about all these technologies and what is coming out, I've been maintaining a blog on medical robotics for over seven years, and um, you're most welcome to comment and check it out. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Damash, for a very informative and very inspiring uh, lecture. So I think we have a couple of minutes for questions, so I would like to open the uh, global virtual lecture hall for uh, questions. <clears throat> so maybe I can, I can start uh, with one. So you were mentioning in, uh, uh, in your uh, lecture the idea of having a robot repeat a particular operation, right? I mean, that would be fantastic. You know, it's been doing it and you just push the button and it will repeat the operation. Now, we do have a few problems there because of course, in a manufacturing environment where everything is controlled, everything is going to be the same. So repetition is basically very easy to do. Whereas in a surgical environment, repetition is an extreme. It's not really repetition, right? Exactly. So this is the transition. But if you, if you look into new ways in industrial automation, um, this, is, this is also the new way, uh, the bulk and the other robots, because it's not going to be a position-controlled repetition of a task anymore. It's a there is a little cognition behind, so it's going to be task level repetition. So when you when you tell your robot to to close this uh, wound, the robot will not repeat the same motion as it did before. But with the visual uh, senses and everything, 
it will be able to identify the task. And then, through that, we can make sure that it repeats the same task and not the same kind of motion. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question here from uh, Zurich. Sure. Right, go ahead. At what point in time would you have yourself undergo a surgery performed by an autonomous system? Oh, uh, good question. Uh, I, I trust what I, I... No, I won't even trust what I built, so it's, it's getting very tricky. But, but in general, um, I think it's, it's a number of test cases that you have seen, that the depth of understanding you have towards a system. And then even today, just like for, for simple cases, I think we could trust systems. So we can already build for simple surgeries so-called uh, knowledge bases, automated knowledge bases that are going to derive the right answer. Like, uh, what, it, it's the same thing what you go online and you're trying to identify what uh, sickness you have, and they, they guide you through a decision tree, and at the end they say, okay, take this and that pill. Do you trust it or not? I mean, there's a lower risk, of course, but we start to trust these technologies. So I think um, it will come very soon. Okay. So do we have another question from the Global Lecture Hall? I think it's a topic that Hi, will turn off. Yes. Um, is there any um, vibration uh, issue concern in the medical robots? <laughs> you mean vibration? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no size. You know, they, they use, for example, in the case of Da Vinci, where they have teleoperation, um, you could have uh, vibration from two sources. Uh, one could be on the hardware level, uh, but they use access to the best servos and the best mechatronic structure to build around the robot to stabilize it. And from the control side, you could experience vibrations if you have a lag time and your control algorithm cannot deal with that. Uh, for that case, on one hand, they have very, very fast uh, control cycle. I think it's, it's around uh, 20 kilohertz. And uh, on the other hand, they do not, they did not allow for the Da Vinci to, put, to do real telesurgery to put the master and the slave devices apart from each other. Now they have opened the interface, they are experimenting with it. Even with another system, there have been some internet-based surgeries, uh, and there it could be a different uh, difficulty, cause some difficulty, but that you, can, you can handle it on the control level. I have some um, key references I can point to you at if, you, if you're interested in that, about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe we take one last question. Last question. Uh... A question from Madrid. Okay, go ahead. Yes, um, I was wondering if you could comment on the, the role of soft robotics in medical uh, surgery um, with robots uh, now and in the future. Okay, so now currently the problem with soft robotics is that um, you, uh, you incorporate so much on the design level about the flexibility, flexibility or the softness really that you, you're really interested to looking at the action rather than, than what the outcome is, like the way how the robot is performing. And I don't think in, in surgery at this point, uh, liability would prevent it. Because if you, if you do surgery, and if there are, there are always serious consequences. So uh, for now, I don't think it's, it's going to be introduced into the operating room. So you, you want to approach it from the classical industrial uh, clean and bright, uh, precision-controlled way when you know what you're doing with your robot and you want to you be able to tell always, even ahead in time, what's going to happen. Uh, for the distant future, um, there are some, some initi initiatives, and that could happen on the micro-robotics level. So what some people working, for example, also in, that, uh, in Zurich, uh, there are some excellent groups focusing on micro- and nanoscale robots uh, that you can swallow uh, or get injected, and they could be so small, just like molecule size, that with an external ma uh, magnetic field, such as the MR scanner's field, they could be directed to a certain part of your body, to, for example, to release some specific drugs there. And then it becoming a soft uh, robotic uh, treatment in terms of it's going to be a statistical treatment, 
Most of the robots will get there, they will do something there, but there will always be some, some leftovers around your body. So I think in that area, we will see it soon. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion and thank you again, Tamas, for a very fascinating lecture and, you know, pointing us into uh, future applications of uh, robotics. So thank you again. I think this was an extremely informative and uh, inspiring lecture.